Welcome to the final session of, uh, of this year's Freedom Zone, where we're looking at strengthening democracy and what is the point of voting nowadays. Um, to my far right, if he's ever been called that before, well maybe he has, is uh, Spencer Piffield, who's Director of Conservative, uh, Policy, Conservative Policy Forum. Next to me is uh, Councillor Peter Golds from uh, Tower Hamlets, the leader of the Conservative Group. We have Nigel Fletcher, who is the founder for the Centre of Opposition Studies. And to my extreme left uh, is <laughs> Mark Clark, the founder of the audience is expressing Did you want to move, Mark? <laughs> and I think we'll start uh, in order. And uh, Spencer. Well, thank you. Can I say I've never had such a great opportunity to speak to you. Well, it's switched on now. Sitting in one of these big black armchairs. It's a bit like uh, flying first class. Um, I'm very grateful for the invitation. Um, it's been a very exciting and long day. Uh, but I, I look forward to, to chatting with you about how we might potentially strengthen democracy. Um, I have a few sort of asides to start off with. I grew up in South Africa. I would say to you that as a young white Roynek, someone who was from England, um, I was involved heavily with a group of people who said that it was right that there should be one person one vote. And democracy is a very interesting thing because your democratic colours change according to the circumstances that you might find yourself in. Added to that, I would say to you that clearly the only game in town, there's a lot of feedback on this, but uh, I don't know whether you could turn it down a little, sir, but um, the only game in town is a democratic game. Uh, we need to jaw jaw, not war war. And we only have to look outside of our boundaries to understand the kind of problems uh, communities and countries face when they decide to settle questions uh, in an undemocratic um, way. And so that that is very important. But we are at a, a very difficult time in our democracy, and some of it stems, in my humble opinion, from a terrible loss of faith and trust in politicians, uh, the belief that politicians are in it for their own ends, and that there is a big dislocate with communities across our country who frankly do not trust any politician of necessarily any political party and the ramifications associated to that. I have to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, I do not think that the 24 hour a day, seven days a week, news cycle and the pressures that places on a coherent uh, one voice political party uh, help the situation because you have, we have ended up in a situation where it is very difficult for politicians if they would like to be part of a group of individuals to speak with that individual voice which resonates with people who are out there who we hope to represent. And this is where someone like Farage, I believe, is very successful because he is able to speak directly to people and frankly say whatever he would like at any time of any part of the day because, as you saw from his conference speech, it's all made up on the spur of the moment. So we are at this really important watershed situation. And I would say to you, it's going to go one of two ways. Our politics is going to become more dislocated, more disparate, uh, moving towards a situation, hopefully we won't get to the Italian model just yet, but a situation where you have many more small groups of parties trying to cobble together ideas. And we only have to see this with the rise of independent councillors across our country, communities wanting to vote for independents, not <coughs> badged party politicians. Or we have to understand that we need to recover our democracy in our political parties in order to gain trust with the people that we aspire to represent. My final point, Andreas, some four years ago, those of us who care passionately about the opportunity for all members in the Conservative Party to contribute to the development of policy came up with the re-wacky idea, because we had the CPC and the CPC had um, obviously gone off the boil and wasn't working, to say, surely, if we cannot, as a democratic party, make sure that all members in that party have their opportunity to have their say, then how can we hope to aspire to represent people in the greater country? I would say to you, it's not perfect, the CPF, 
Uh, there are many things that we need to do, but the reality is the party has started to embrace this, this democratic ability to say within our party that you can come up with those weird and wacky ideas, we can deliver them directly to our elected representatives. They don't always listen, but we started to square that circle. It doesn't really work, but you understand what I'm saying. To say that every part of our party, whether you be elected, whether you be professional, whether you be voluntary, has that opportunity to interface uh, with uh, policy development. And so I would say to you, this is this is this is where we're at. We either understand that there is a democratic deficit within our political parties, the big parties, or we find ourselves in a more dislocated, disparate politic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, Peter. Um, thank you very much. Before I really turn to life in London, most rotten, rotten borough, I, I share with you something I, I sent to the BBC just two weeks ago because I listened to the Today programme on the day of the Scottish referendum and the BBC, as they do on the Today programme, were intoning this was like to be the biggest ever vote in an election held in the United Kingdom. So I immediately got onto the computer and I sent a note to everybody I knew at the BBC pointing out that the British general election of 1950 held on a snowy day in February <coughs> had a turnout of over 83%. There were constituencies that had turned out of over 90%. There was petrol rationing, limited postal votes, and people went to a polling station. Also at that election, and I think this fits entirely what Spencer just said, over 90% of the electorate voted either Conservative or Labour. Nobody else, either Conservative or Labour. And this was a day when, con when there were conservative associations with 12,000 paid up members that would campaign. In Winston Churchill's constituency of Woodford, in his, in his biography, he talks of every night sending 1,000 young conservatives to campaign in Walthamstow East and the marginal seats that surrounded the constituency of Woodford. And it is this extraordinary disengagement that has come now where a Conservative association with 250 members is thought to be a viable Conservative association. Mm -hmm. And I would look at our opponents, a Labour association, a Labour constituency, <coughs> Labour Party with 250 members is thought to be viable. And that is actually a hollowed out part of the political process because... I hate to say this, if you've got 250 people representing the Conservative Party in, let us say, the cities of London and Westminster South constituency, and I just picked that out as a name, it could be Arundel and South Downs, it could be Richmond, Yorkshire, they're not scarcely representative of the 20-odd thousand people that voted Conservative in that constituency. The problem is these people frequently talk to themselves, and exactly what we heard earlier on, they look at the 24-hour news cycle and recycle what they have often heard on the news to a disproportion elsewhere. Decades ago, the BBC newspapers re didn't were restricted on what they could say. You wouldn't read of a newspaper that would have said, Theresa May is expected to announce this morning that. It would have been the headline news tonight, Theresa May said. People would have listened to that. By the time we get... Tonight, tonight news, we get to news night, it's filleted through everything else. Before tomorrow's newspapers, the story is dead. It was known this morning what she was going to say before she got up. And I believe there needs to be a maturity amongst our, amongst our politicians. Politics is not strictly come dancing. It's not, it's not a game show. It is far more important than that because what happens decides people's lives. And... If you are talking of making a decision, you can only make that decision within a big group and a wider family because it will be a big group or a wider family that will make that decision sitting in a parliamentary assembly, a local authority, call it what you may. If you fragment to tiny, <coughs> tiny little groups, then you are heading for trouble. I think UKIP, in many ways, are almost like the what the trots were in the 1980s. And I'm old enough to remember when the Labour Party spl started splitting in the element that caused the foundation of the Social Democratic Party. And they, they were found to an insurgency, an insurgency that said to certain elements of the Labour Party, will give you everything you actually possibly think in the back of your mind. Socialism tomorrow, real socialism by lunchtime tomorrow. 
And this is what UKIP stand for. They stand for a vision of the United Kingdom that possibly never existed. And I will conclude on that with um, a reference to UKIP. And people may know, will find this surprising. Did you know that Godfrey Bloom is younger than all of the Beatles and all of the Rolling Stones? Well, when <coughs> Margaret Thatcher came to power, Nigel Farage was a 15-year-old schoolboy. Now, he could have had formed opinions, mm. but you get the position from every speech. At the moment, Mar Margaret Thatcher crossed the threshold of number 10. Nigel Farage was tapping on her shoulder, telling her what to do. Actually, he was a 15-year-old schoolboy. And they have created this strange myth, a myth that <coughs> needs to be broken. Thank you, Peter. Nigel. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, just an introduction to the Centre for Opposition Studies for those of you who understandably don't, don't know us. Um, we are, as the name might suggest, um, a think tank which is dedicated to the study of political opposition um, and promoting that, um, that field of research. Um, you're, you may be familiar with organisations like the Institute for Government, which study um, government, and I think that the parallel and the contrast is, is drawn quite starkly by the fact they have a palatial mansion on one side of St James's Park. We're on the other side of the park in a basement. Uh, that tells you everything you need to know about the relative power of government uh, versus opposition and also the, the study of those institutions. So we're trying to re, uh, sort of rebalance that slightly by uh, ensuring that there is a, a field of, of study which is looking at opposition. And the reason that's important um, is for two reasons really, and, and we're mainly concerned with the study of uh, what we would call official opposition or, or in the British context, loyal opposition. Um, and it matters for two reasons. Firstly, it's the scrutiny of government. It's holding government to account. It's the opposition who will be there every day, uh, scrutinising what the government do, responding to it, um, and holding them to account. And secondly, the fact they are uh, the alternative government. They're the ones who give us a mechanism for chucking out uh, the government. And uh, it's often said that the removal van in Downing Street is a, is a very powerful um, reason for, for having um, that, that very decisive um, election result that we're used to in Britain. Um, and the fact that you have a, a formed and cohesive opposition um, is, is vital to that. Um, and coming back to something that, that's already been said about, about UKIP, offering all things to all people, one thing people will accept is the fact that UKIP are not going to be tomorrow's government. So however much they might appeal to people's view of they can promise whatever they like, they know they're not going to be in government um, tomorrow. And there is a role, which is very important for an official opposition, for being the people who could be in government um, tomorrow. And that in itself um, keeps the government um, on their toes. They know they could be chucked out um, at the next election. Um, so the first thing that we, we try and convey to people is the fact that it matters for that reason. The second um, point is that it matters that it's done well. We need to have an effective opposition. And that's important not just to the party concerned, it's not just important to the Labour Party that they, their prospects for the next election are better if they are a better opposition. It's important to all of us and it's actually important to the government itself that you have an effective um, and strong opposition. If it's done badly, uh, you can be stuck with a government that gets away with more than it should get away with. Uh, and also the electorate at the next election are denied a realistic choice. Uh, you could argue in 1983, if you were a Labour supporter, you would go and dutifully vote for the Labour Party, but you knew that this party was not going to form the next government. Um, and, um, and so effectively, Margaret Thatcher was, was able to, uh, to transform Britain, which I personally was very happy with. Um, but if you were a Labour supporter, that was, that, that's, that's a democratic deficit in terms of, of how the opposition was, was fulfilling its role. And we can all think of leaders of the opposition not up to the job. I mean, one of the... I thought I was being particularly mean to Ed Miliband. I was up in uh, the Labour conference last week, tweeting away along with everyone else and sort of uh, ridiculing what he was saying. I thought I was being particularly mean until I saw what the correspondents were saying. And um, uh, the kindest thing I could think of to say was that I, I didn't think Miliband's speech was as bad as some that Ian Duncan Smith had given when he was leader of the opposition, uh, or some that, um, that Michael Foote had given. Um, but we can all think of it, all, all, all parties, people who just the public perceive are not up to the job. Uh, and if they're not able to pr present a realistic alternative, that, that has a, an impact. So we're looking at, at, at how to do it better, and, um, and there are some practical things that you can, can look at. A lot of those are tied up with ensuring that Parliament itself is stronger. Um, official opposition in Britain is a, effectively a parliamentary institution, so things like the fact that the, the Parliament can't be recalled unless the government says so is clearly wrong. I mean, everyone has, has picked up on that recently, that... The fact that the government have to um, set the wheels in motion is clearly wrong. It has to be something that comes from Parliament and that power has to go to them. Um, to give the, the current Speaker his due, he has um, increased the number of urgent questions that are, uh, are asked in Parliament. So the assumption now is if the opposition wants to ask a question uh, of a minister and call them to the House, that will be granted. So that's um, a tool which is being used more. 
But we need to go much further in that, and the opposition needs to be much stronger um, in the House. There's other ideas which, um, which we, we've talked about, um, including ensuring that, um, that the opposition has better, better staffing and better expertise. Um, it's, there's a huge imbalance between the amount of uh, resource that the government can call upon to uh, cost its policies, to develop policy, and the amount that the opposition has. Um, and, and if uh, an election is, uh, is held without that scrutiny having been done, the preparation being done, we can be landed with a government which hasn't really thought through its policy. And again, going back to Labour last week, there was a lot of talk about the fact that they haven't got policies. Well, they do have policies. My question would be, have they actually done the work that's necessary to make sure they're going to work? Um, I just want to finish on something which we've um, started doing some work on, which we're going to be launching in the, the near future, and I think it will relate to some things that Peter will have to say, uh, I hope anyway, um, during the rest of the panel, um, which is that um, a lot of these, uh, these issues about the strength of opposition and ensuring there is a, a proper choice in our democracy are particularly relevant to local government. Um, I'm a victim of the, uh, uh, of the last uh, set of local elections where in the People's Republic of, of Greenwich, um, we've always had a very small but quite effective um, local opposition. I lost my seat in May and we're now down to um, eight councillors with an overwhelming Labour majority. They've been in power for getting on for 50 years and there are boroughs now which are one-party states uh, and certainly many boroughs which have only had one party in power for a long time. Um, and when you get to that position, uh, for example in Lewisham where they're, they're, the Conservatives have now been wiped out and there's, the opposition now consists of one Green councillor, um, can that, that councillor really effectively hold the, uh, the executive to account? Uh, and once you lose that, then all these issues, the fact that you, you don't hold um, the executive to, to account, you don't present a proper choice, all of those things become quite real. Um, and if that happened at Westminster, if we had 50 years with one party in power and no real um, prospect of a change of government, we'd start asking questions about how is our democracy working? You know, we'd start asking questions about the electoral system, we'd start saying well, how do we re-engage people, how do we... Um, how do we uh, rebalance this to ensure that we have a proper choice at elections because this is clearly undemocratic. It's happening across the country in local government uh, and it's happening increasingly um, in many councils and it's not being taken as seriously as, as it should be. So we're going to be launching in the next um, few months um, a campaign um, called Strong Voice, Real Choice to try and highlight the issue of, of, of there not being um, this effective choice to try and offer practical advice on how you do, do opposition um, better um, and I would just, just name check Peter as one person I think who will be um, very prominent in our uh, wish list of people we'd want to get together with other um, local government representatives to say you know how do you function in what is um, a really quite challenging political environment. There are others on the Labour side, Paul de Moldenberg um, has been leader of the opposition for forever I think in, in Westminster and, um, and he also has got you know a, a large toolkit of, of how you hold a um, a, a council to account. And all of those things, as I say, they, they sort of represent the, the issues I've talked about in terms of, of, of opposition nationally. Um, and I think by starting that discussion, uh, people are much more alive to that in local government. But some of those lessons I think that we draw out of that will be much more relevant as well to Westminster. Thank you. Mark? So the question of why do people not vote? I think it comes down to this. What is the point in voting if your vote doesn't make a difference? And there is too much that has gone on in our country over the last 40 years which has taken power away from those people who are supposed to be representing those who vote for them and given it to people who have absolutely no mandate for, that, for making those decisions and those people who are unaccountable. And that falls into several areas of life and it covers a whole range of different uh, administrations. Let's deal with what happens within our own country. There has been a successive failure of politicians to stand up for the fact that they are supposed to be making decisions in the interests of the people who voted for them. And therefore politicians have become ashamed to make difficult decisions. Let us go back to something that was greeted with universal acclaim, which was the independence of the Bank of England. Gordon Brown said, well, interest rate decisions are far too serious to be left to politicians. This is code for, these are far too serious to be left to people who are accountable to voters. And therefore they must be given to an independent set of people who I will appoint but who are answerable to nobody. Uh, those people, trust me, this is, this is in your best interest that they will make these decisions. Well, let me tell you something. At the last election, people voted for the Conservative Party or the, Lib or the Liberal Party or even for the Labour Party. But there wasn't anybody who was mainstream party that was standing for political office 
on an economic platform to set interest rates targeting an unemployment rate. Nobody stood for Parliament on that platform. Standing for Parliament on that platform kind of went out of fashion in the late 1970s. But yet we now have an interest rates which are set in order to target a particular unemployment target, unemployment rate. Now you may have your views of whether that is right or that is wrong, and you should be able to express those views at the ballot box, but you have had no opportunity to do so. You have no opportunity to decide whether or not the Bank of England is printing money like we have not seen since the era of the Weimar Republic. You may think that is a good thing, you may think that is a bad thing. It doesn't matter what you think, you have no say in whether or not it should be done. We have the absurd situation where the governor of the Bank of England stands up and announces, in fact, she announces almost every week a slightly different policy as he, as he, as he positions things to the markets, and our Chancellor has to trot out after him saying, well, that was a very interesting speech that I just heard, and obviously I fully support it because I support the Bank of England. He had no idea what was being said. Who knows whether he agrees with it. It doesn't matter anyway. He just becomes, unfortunately, a commentator on what is being happening around major economic decisions. Now, as I said, I'm not saying these decisions are good or they are bad. I'm just saying you have no say in them. But it's not just the Labour Party. The largest item of government expenditure is the National Health Service. The National Health Service is consistently in the top three issues of concern to voters. The Conservative government, the Conservatives in opposition, are not so concerned that they could not be trusted with the NHS, that their solution to not being trusted with the NHS was to say, do not worry, you can vote for us and not trust us with the NHS, because we will have an independent board who will manage the NHS for you. Therefore, you can vote for us and feel, and feel confident that we will not do anything bad to your NHS. So we now have decisions that are made around hospital closures and <coughs> openings, large-scale policy decisions in the NHS, what drugs should be invested in, etc., which are made by an independent quangocracy. You cannot change their decisions. Mm. Prime Minister just looks on. You saw these decisions that were made recently with that, that, that young child who was taken off and couldn't get cancer care and ended up going off to, off to, off to Prague, off to the Czech Republic, etc. And the Prime Minister, all he could do was say, I, I very much disapprove of what is going on and I hope somebody pays attention to me. He was just became like you and me, but he just had a bigger media profile and a press team. But there was nothing he could do about it. He had given control of all that away. And now we have the Labour Party who was saying, well, we, are, we want to protect our, um, because they're in hock to the unions, and they know that they control the education establishment, or the blob, as, um, as some people like to call it. So their solution to try and stop Michael Gobes of the future is to try and give control of education to an independent board who will look after it free from politicians. This is code, my friends, for free from right-wing people who want to do the best interests of parents, free from Michael Gove's in the future. They want to consign it into, a, uh, into concrete, essentially, keep it free from politicians. So we now have large chunks of our economic policy taken out of democracy. We now have large chunks of our health service taken out of democracy. We may have large chunks of our schools taken out of democracy. You wonder why people don't vote? That's why people don't vote. And that's before we get on to the elephant in the room of this conference, which is the continuing powers which are being given to Brussels. People know that when they give those powers to Brussels, it is harder for them to influence them from the United Kingdom. People know that a huge percentage of our laws are made in Brussels, where British MEPs are consistently outvoted, MEPs of all parties. How many times have we heard people say, I, we heard it today, Boris Johnson said, I will oppose the common agricultural policy, I will fight for reform. Find me a British politician in the last 40 years who has said anything different. We have had anti-European uh, politicians who have said the same thing. We have had pro-European politicians who have said the same thing. We've had them having constructive attitudes, unconstructive attitudes. They've all said the same thing and they've all failed. Okay? That is large chunks of our agricultural policy. Nobody in Britain agrees with, but we can do nothing about it. And we now have a leader of the European Union that literally not one single person in Britain voted for. Not one single person voted for. And that person going to be striding the world stage and us what we can do and what we cannot do. European Union passing laws, we have to have banker bonuses capped, large, under, you know, a huge threat to our Bank of England. We have no say, we do not agree, we can do nothing about it. And you wonder why people don't vote. Right? Who's the foolish person? The person who votes for nothing or the person who says, you know what, it makes no difference, I can't change this stuff. So if we want people to vote, we have to make it clear that voting matters. 
that your vote makes a difference. We saw up in Scotland that people knew that their vote had, a, had consequences. They could vote to stay in, they could vote to leave. They knew that their vote would have a consequence and they voted in droves. Mm -hmm. So people will vote when it matters. But if we want them to vote, we have to change the dynamic of what, of what politicians can control, what people can control, and we need to stop doing what Harold Macmillan warned against, warned against the 1960s, when he said, we have not fought for centuries against the divine right of kings in order to give power to the divine right of bureaucrats. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'm really pleased you mentioned quangos, because given, you yeah, know, ruling by quangos is one of the biggest things that just annoys me all the time. And uh, a former colleague of mine and when I was at the Taxpayers Alliance, uh, Susie Squire, described uh, quangos, you know, it's, it, it's just like, after, they're like cockroaches after a nuclear blast, you know, they, they just still exist. Every government pro promises a bonfire the quangos. How many times much older people will remember it all the time? It's constantly all the time. We're going to scale back, and then new ones are created all the time. The same it, people. Well, yeah, exactly. It, it, it just reminded me of a little story, really, because I, that I wrote about earlier. There's, there's something called shore fishing. Uh, it's on the East Coast, particularly in Yorkshire, or off the East Yorkshire coast. And basically, it, only half a dozen people do it. They put their nets out on the beach, and um, at... Um, a uh, little, I'm trying to think a little time. God, my brain isn't working tonight. Anyway, when the sea's out, sea comes in, fills up the nets, goes back out again at, um, at high tide. And you might get catch around about half a dozen fish, something like that. But the Environment Agency, the almighty Environment Agency, that's of course bigger than DEFRA, has turned around to those fishermen and said, you must watch your, fi your, your nets 24 hours a day. Now, how on earth can one person watch their nets 24 hours a day? It's not for health and safety reasons. It's got nothing to do with, with, with anything like that. It's got to do with sustainability. Now, we're talking about someone catching about half a dozen sea bass that are already tagged, where it's all to do with sustainability. And they can't go anywhere. They, they, they actually wrote to, uh, to Lord Smith, and uh, Lord Smith wrote back to them, but he muddled up shore fishing with trawler fishing. So he clearly didn't understand anything <laughs> like that. They got absolutely nowhere. Now, a question that I have, and maybe you, you, all of you would like to, to chip in on this one, is how do we stop that? I mean, how about uh, select committees having real powers to, to, to make decisions? Because this isn't something for the, the... Decisions like that aren't something for the courts, yeah. but it certainly should be something for Parliament to decide to rein these quangos in. I mean, do you think select committees should have, have even more teeth? Anyone? Parliament is missing power. Uh, in a previous lifetime, I worked in the chemical industry and I went to Europe with a company that had, which had produced a product which would revolutionise aspects of our life. There was one tiny problem on it. It contained chlorine. And the moment you get anything that contains chlorine, the Germans will go hysterical because what is the chemical base of Zyklon B, the gas that was used in the gas chambers of Auschwitz? It's a form of chlorine. And to this day, the moment we went near the European part, we went near Brussels, you had every German you had ever seen, and they just killed it stone dead. And this was a product that would revolutionise your life, your life, and indeed your life. Mm -hmm. And until you rein in that unelected, that ghastly, that ghastly bureaucracy, nothing can happen. Surely the decision of to use chlorine in the product should be, a, should be a decision of the people of the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's a real problem, because you've got... Um, these two aspects, as I say, you know, opposition isn't just official opposition, that's mainly what we, we study, but um, opposition exists in every context, you know, opposition to the European Union, opposition to quangos and the rest of it. The problem with quangos is that, that you may have scrutiny through a select committee, you may be able to um, look at what they're doing, you can't get rid of them. And you've got to have those two things, you've got to have the, the person in charge has got to know that not only are they going to be called to account, but they are ultimately able to be kicked out. Um, I mean, some of you might be familiar with the, the questions that Tony Benn used to trot out about, you know, yeah. the thing you should always ask about a, a politician. Where did you get your power from? And how do I get rid of you? And, and a number of others. And it's the key question, you know, how, you know, how, how do I get rid of you? And um, I think the problem with too many quangos, we can graft on accountability, but it's not proper accountability unless, at the end of the day, we can turn around and dismiss you. Yes, yeah. I think it was, was it... Um 
Jim Hacker in Yes Minister, yeah, who's, who, who said about uh, the opposition, they aren't the real opposition, it's the civil service that's the opposition in yes. residence. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to open it up to the floor, any, uh, any questions? Uh, my, my glamorous assistant, uh, Kristen, has done a fantastic job these last two days. Mm. She's been filming all the time and handing the microphone around. Great job. Uh, Mick. Thank you. I'd just like to ask all the panel their views on the uh, fit for, for purposeness or otherwise of the Electoral Commission. <laughs> Anybody want to start on that? I'll come in at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of those issues. How long have you got? <laughs> I think the direct answer is it's not fit for purpose. We all know that. Um, I'd like to, if I may, though, this is a very nice segue, but it's not a good segue at all, just come back to the democratic deficit and just make two points. In my city, Sheffield, I am the one blue in the village, according to all of the organisations of any influence. It comes really back to what Mark says, too. I'm not the one blue in the village, because 50,000 people voted Conservative in Sheffield, but they have no voice whatsoever. They have no Member of Parliament, they have no councillor. And we have this incredible democratic deficit which is on two sides. Firstly, we have no ability to influence on any kind of level across almost the whole of South Yorkshire. I have the great pleasure of being <coughs> spokesman for the party across South Yorkshire, two million people. So this is a bit... We have a situation where we have a one-party, almost socialist, um, I nearly said Soviet socialist state uh, in, in operation. But more important than that, everyone, our party, my party, have a big problem. We don't go near South Yorkshire. We just, we, it's almost a completely... No, the last time a Minister of State came to South Yorkshire, I cannot remember, and I'm the spokesman, South Yorkshire. And across our country there are polarised regions where we have just red or just blue and a few places where we have some slightly mixed colours but it's mostly no-go zones. Until we understand that we need to address a, a system of voting which makes sure that my yeah. blue vote yeah. in South Yorkshire actually yeah. counts for something, we're on the fast train to absolute nowhere. The other point I would make, and quite imbibed by the, what has been said by, by the panel, is we need a radical agenda. And what we've been arguing is, rather than just sitting on the periphery where we mess around with the edges, is we've got to get radical. And radical, ladies and gentlemen, is to reflect what the people are saying. And we do not often reflect what the people are saying because we're too blooming scared to say it. And you get this terrible dislocate. So it links into a lot of what has been said, but until we get that ability to say, actually, I want the referendum now. I personally have argued for it now. I accept the reasons why we can't have it now, coalition, but why do we have to wait until 2017? People don't trust what we politicos, I'm not elected politician, are saying. But if we said to the people, we actually do hear you, and the Prime Minister's position is a very fair position. We'd like to renegotiate, we'd like to have the time to do that. But we have no opportunity to have our say if the other lot get in. So why not say, if we came back early on, we'd give emergency time to make sure that we got that referendum in the first six months. Perhaps people would start waking up and say, actually, maybe they've got a point. <laughs> Well, there goes my career. <laughs> <laughs> Electoral Commission. <laughs> Tower Hamlets is the most corrupt, incompetent local authority in the country. On the 23rd of May of this year, my, I did and my colleague, Councillor Chris Chapman, sitting there, arrived at the count for the London Borough of Tower Hamlets at 11 o'clock on a Friday morning. My ward of Island Gardens was declared at half past 11 on the Sunday evening. We sat there for five days. If I tell you in my ward, on the first count, I secured 1,098 votes. I've got the count sheet here. By the time my declaration came on, I'd secured 1,348 votes. There must be something extraordinary about that. We have written over the years 
to the Electoral Commission and the police. I have files of letters to the, to the police where we've had the situation of houses with 18 names on the electoral register. I've been with Carl Mercer of the BBC, a traditional lefty who has knocked on a door and his film saying, do 18 people live here? And a Russian will come to the door and say, no, sir, no, sir, I live here, I live here. So 18 people don't live here, but they are on the electoral register and they had votes. The police do nothing. I mean nothing, not a word. They issue statements saying everything well. At our count that I referred to, the Right Honourable Sadiq Khan could not leave the count. He was coming representing the Labour Party because the police could not guarantee his safety to leave the count. Early in the morning, Jim Fitzpatrick, Labour Member of Parliament for Pop from Limehouse, came to me and said, do any of your women need to leave the count? I have got a police escort to take women from my group out, and we assembled Labour and Conservative women in a group, and they were escorted under police escort to leave the count. The police said everything went well. How do you have a situation, and I have it here, I've got the proof, um, where we had a countermanded poll, where one man can, in the space of six weeks, between the 22nd of May and the 3rd of July, contest two elections in two wards, using two different names and two different fraudulent addresses, and I've got the proof here, and you can see his signatures, and the police, the, the, the Sir Bernard Hogan House says, there's no case to answer. Because, and I have written to Hogan House, and I've got the letter here, and I, as I say, I'm making the allegations here, and you may see these, you may take these documents away with you. I have said to Hogan how the Rotherham option is no is no alternative. I can go on for hours of telling you what it's like. What is it, I can tell you what like when I've spoken at a council meeting and one of Rahman's supporters in that traditional English fashion says, sit down you effing old queer. We got a photograph of it. The police did nothing. They refused to do it. We've sent them complaints of behaviour when a Labour councillor had to be escorted to the lavatory because she was under threat and the police took six months to answer the letter. And of course, it was six months and one day. So they had no need to take anything further until the Electoral Commission and the police look at what is happening here, what happened in Rochdale, what's happened in, in, in Rotherham and all these other places. It will go on unabated. And so if you want to have a look, the proof sitting here. So really what you're saying is that the police are not fit for purpose either? No. Mm -hmm. Totally incompetent. Can, sorry, can, sorry, can, I, can, I, can I come in on this as well? So the... Um, uh, I, I've had not the similar experiences to, to Peter's, but not on such a uh, consistent basis. I was a candidate in Tooting at the last election. Um, uh, let me assure you, Sadiq Khan was in this room. I'm not sure he would get out without a police escort either. So, <laughs> the, um, the, so the, um, I was a candidate in Tooting. The, you know, the, there is a real problem that there is increasing amounts of voter fraud which is occurring in, in, in this country. And the police are turning a blind eye to it, the Electoral Commission are turning a blind eye to it, and returning officers in local councils are turning a blind eye to it, right? And it is not, I know people think, so the stories that have happened in Tower Hamlets, some people think, well, that is a weird freak thing that is going on because, you know, there's all the kind of issues, right? Actually, they are functions of systemic problems that we have that go, that go way outside Tower Hamlets. Uh, I was attacked in a mosque by people who openly said that they were supporting Sadiq Khan and they said that they were going to kill me. Okay? There were a hundred of them, but up against the wall, trying to kill me, right? The police did nothing. Local Labour MPs were so outraged by what happened, they raised it in Parliament. Police did nothing. Sadiq Khan was then confronted with it and he said, I had no idea this had happened in my mosque where I had been going since I was a child, and even though the local Labour MP mentioned in Parliament, first I've heard of it. There we are. And we found 500 people, 500 people who were registered, multiple occupancy, large numbers of postal votes, living in one or two bedroom houses. There 25 people with postal votes, 25 men, Muslim men, living with postal votes in a one bedroom flat. <laughs> Police did nothing. Look, returning officer in a conservative borough did nothing. Okay? And what they turn around and they say to you when you complain is, if you believe that there is voter fraud happening, you can go to the High Court and take an election petition out after the event. It is not our problem. So they turn a blind eye to criminality. The returning officer just says, 
look, there is a form filled out. Mm. It is simply my job to take the form which is filled out and update it onto the electoral register. That is it. So the problem, you see, I think, is not actually in the Electoral Commission. The problem is not actually in, in the returning officers or in the police, right? The problem is that these people need to be told very clearly and empowered very clearly that they have an investigative role right? and not just a managing the mm. process role. Right? Now, the police should be told that, should know that already, but they are turning a blind eye because they want an easy life. Right? But returning officers believe that they have a process managing role mm. and actually they should have an investigatory role and they should have powers to investigate during an election, beforehand, etc. The Electoral Commission are actually really just kind of managing and advising on a process, right? And really what they are is they, get, they produce great handbooks on how to be a good agent, right? And great handbooks on how to fill out your forms, right? And genuinely, they're very well written. Okay? They, they produce kind of quite good material. But it is, it, it's kind of like, you know, playing, playing the orchestra on the Titanic when the ship is going down. Mm -hmm. you know? It's simply not enough. And unfortunately, what we've had in this parliament is... The Conservatives have believed that individual voter registration is the only answer, this is the solution, and it's simply not. Right? I don't want to say it's a bad thing, it is helpful, right? It is helpful, but it is absolutely not the answer when you have what is increasing amounts, I believe, of organised voter fraud going on and a see no evil, hear no evil approach from the authorities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I quickly add something? Oh, sorry, no, I, think so, so I, I was agree. just going to say, um, we, we do quite a bit of work with. Um, <laughs> Uh, overseas visitors who, who come and, and uh, we, we try and talk to about opposition. And um, one thing I'm very keen to stress to them is often de developing democracies, um, representatives from the Middle East who are um, struggling towards a form of democracy. I'm always very careful to say to them, when we're telling you how opposition works in this country, we're also telling them how it doesn't work. And we're not in any way trying to say our, our de democracy is perfect. Mm. Um, and you only need to listen to these sorts of stories um, for them to be able to turn around and say, well, you know, you're not really in a position to lecture us on this, are you? Um, and I think part of the reason it's not being faced up to is it's, it's very difficult for us as, as the sort of the, the mother of parliament, um, to, to use that in its correct term, um, to accept the fact that our democracy is not perfect and that, that it's not just a question of revising the rules, looking at how we can change the electoral system and uh, rewrite these, these rule books and guidance. It's actually about how the system works and that there is corruption and there is fraud mm -hmm. and that the, the, the rules that we have and we're very comfortable talking about are not being applied properly. Um, and on one very specific point, coming back to the Electoral Commission, I think, I think Mark's absolutely right that they need to, to accept they have an investigatory role. But I think the position of returning officers um, is, is, is particularly open to challenge. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, making those specific allegations, I think, you know, the, um, but I, I think there will always be a suspicion um, that if the chief executive of a local authority is the returning officer for that authority's elections, um, we all know how they are appointed. They work very closely with the, uh, the, with the majority party in that council. It's very easy for them to become native. And um, even if they, uh, they do their job uh, absolutely perfectly and there is no question about their impartiality, he says quickly, um, then it's very easy for people to, to question whether they are, are doing that. And I think there's a particular um, case in town that's the fact that you know, the returning officer is the chief executive and the chief executive is, is, is an acting individual. And um, so this question is very real. But um, you know, if the Electoral Commission are going to be the people who are guarding the process, then they need to, to take a much bigger role in that rather than leaving it to people who, who may not be open to... Um, to those sorts of challenges. So, so, so the answer to, to appoint independent returning officers, mm. so independent of the council. Yeah. So that would, yeah, I, yeah so. I would agree as well. I mean, can, I, can I just read you something? This might shock you. Um, this is a description of those people who impose, um, have imposed the administration. Some bitterly disenfranchised and now largely impotent local politicians who have not yet come to terms with the directly elected mayor model of local government. Um, the same, in the same descriptions, I strongly suspect that some complainants have personal objections to the administration based on racial prejudice and Islamophobia. This is not from Look for Rahman, this is not a newspaper. This is a direct quote from an email I obtained under Freedom of Information published by a man called Mayak Sullivan Gould, who is the London Borough of Tower Hamlet's interim monitoring officer responsible for legal and probity. We have about 10 minutes left, so if we can have a sort of a quick fire round, as you might say, we'll take two at a time. Uh, that gentleman first there, the microphone's coming to you, sir, and then Thank you, you sir. Yeah, what a depressing picture you're painting, you guys. It's a very important subject, and it's a pity that this room isn't fuller, because it should be full to the rafters. The fault... Is it any constituency? 
I didn't hear that. I'm happy to visit any constituency or area that wants to You've come. You've painted a very bleak picture, a very bleak picture, but it's entirely understandable why it is that we are where we are. Absolutely. Particularly in Greenwich, one of you is in Greenwich, I think. There's a book recently published, I'm literally self-published, Dark Albion. Dark Albion. Albion is a name that's celebrated by William Blake. We have a democratic tradition in this country which is the longest in the world. So when we talk about Dark Albion in Greenwich, we know how close we are to doom. The problem is simply that we have had a corrupt political class on top and we've got no resilience left at local government level. Local power has been removed to Westminster. Westminster's power has been removed to Brussels. So it's remotely surprising we are what we are. We can't begin to find any resurrection of our body politics so long as we are enthralled to Brussels and so long as we have a castrated local democracy. So I think you, Mark, were getting close to where we needed to be. And that is that, in fact, representative democracy is no longer a functioning part of our political system. Mm. It's been corrupted, and that means that the ball is passed firmly into our courts. So it's the fault not in our stars, but in ourselves. We have to rise to the occasion and grasp the responsibility for resurrecting local democracy. But we can't do that without, of course, the yoke of the EU burden being removed. So it's a vicious circle. It's a great tragedy to me. UKIP was tarnished just now by one of your panel members. It is, of course, bizarre that a party which has nothing really of any consequence to offer still has 15% according to the polls. Mm. But we know why that's the case. Because 15% of the people have despaired of the status quo. Mm. There's a, a pop group called the status quo which is still in business. <laughs> they should have hung up their guitars. The Tory party, the Labour party and the Liberal Democrat party should have equally been remaindered and sold on the streets at a fraction of their price. In fact, until we have a resurrection at a local level and a re-engagement with our serious historic body politic, we're going to be going nowhere. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Just, that, just that gentleman there. Oh, just across, thank you. Uh, well, having lived in Birmingham for a number of years, I can see now that uh, Birmingham uh, have obviously been getting their lessons from Ty Hamlets. Uh, <laughs> We've got our lessons from you. <laughs> uh, but I was election agent in a by-election in Spark Brook Ward a few years ago. Uh, we actually got quite a good swing for the Conservatives. It was held by respect over Labour. When they ran all the postal votes through the machine to check for fraud, the machine threw out 60% of them. Um, when they were checked, a few were put back in, but most of them were rejected. At the end of it, the press asked the somewhat thick, if I can call it that, Pakistani Labour candidate what he made of all these votes that had been thrown away, to which he said, to the horror of Albert Bohr, Oh, all those votes that were thrown away, it was absolutely dreadful. If I hadn't lost all those votes, I might have won. <laughs> <coughs> was anything done? Of course it wasn't. Mostly I hadn't told our candidate, who was actually Bangladeshi, not Pakistani, uh, anything about postal votes. Um, but, you no, know, um, to be serious, it is something, when we have a conservative majority government, and hopefully still a strong Home Secretary, which I do believe we have, but she's hamstrung, I think, by being in coalition. They need to tackle this from a national level because there's no way in the relevant councils it can be tackled locally because there's too many interest groups. And somehow, Theresa May or whoever succeeds her, if they're a strong Home Secretary, needs to take action to cut back on this postal voting farce that we have nowadays and cut back on a lot of this and instruct the police to take action where this kind of thing happens. Because until it is sorted out with force from the top, ignoring cultural differences, if that's what the plight word for it is nowadays, um, we're not allowed to say racial nowadays, are we? Um, it's the freedom zone. <laughs> uh, then it is going to go downhill. I don't think it's dramatically affecting parliamentary elections yet, but it's not long before it will. Yeah. It's certainly affecting local elections. 
Thank you, sir. Look, we've got about five minutes left, so I'd just like each panel member just to just to sum up any, any last words. Um, yeah, I, I just want to pick up um, the point about disaffection and about um, the, sort of the UKIP issue, really. Um, the way someone described it to me, I think it's very accurate, is that um, what essentially UKIP have done is, is swept up the, the FU vote. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, two fingers up to the political classes. Um, and one thing that I, I tend to, to try and say to visiting international guests, and I remember, although I wasn't entirely convinced it was translated accurately um, to the <coughs> Speaker of the North Korean Parliament, um, they apparently do have a parliament, but um, was that opposition is not an optional extra, it's something which exists. It's, it's not just an institution, it's a phenomenon. It's everything uh, that exists in people's minds and in their hearts when they, when they oppose something in a political system. So you can't abolish it. The question mark for politicians is what you do about it. And I distill it very simply down to saying you have a choice. You can either have it in your parliaments or you will end up with it on your streets. Um, and it's a very stark choice. You can either represent opposition within your political system or it will find expression elsewhere. And I think what's happened in this country is we have a very large section, a uh, very large minority of the population who are fed up with the entire political class. And they are the, the FU um, uh, party and they have given it a, a name and a badge and that is what uh, we're seeing driving the rise um, of UKIP. So it is in a sense all the people who would previously perhaps have voted uh, Lib Dem in the past as a protest party or they might have voted for other smaller parties or they might not have voted at all, they suddenly have something which is being offered to them as a vehicle for that discontent. So I think it's, it, it's a problem for the political parties but it's also a huge problem um, for uh, the system because it's an expression of something that is wrong with how opposition is being expressed within our political system, I think. Thank you. Uh, could you uh, to say a few final words mm. quickly? You must... One of the tragedies of Douglas Carswell leaving the Conservative Party is that um, I'm concerned that many of the ideas that he outlined in his book, The Plan, some years ago, will be dropped by the Conservative Party. But actually he had some incredibly good ideas for how some of this could be dealt with. Now, I used to live in Switzerland. I lived there for four years. And when I lived in Switzerland, uh, I organised a street party. I also uh, organised a street party just last year um, in where I live in Tooting. Let me tell you the differences of how those things were organised. When I had to organise a street party in Tooting, I had to write to the local council and I had to ask the permission of a council officer in order to have the street closed. There was then an extended period of lobbying by which I asked a variety of unelected people about whether or not we could have permission to have this thing, thing closed. Uh, eventually, after I filled out many forms, um, they did agree to close the street. <coughs> when I was in Switzerland, I wrote to the local council and I said I would like to have this closed, and they did the following. They said, in order for us to close your street, it will cost this amount of money, we have to send some people down, etc. Therefore, we are going to be organising a mini-referendum on your street in order to decide whether or not your street will be closed. We will then add, if that referendum is passed, the cost of closing the street onto the bills. Local people themselves essentially decided whether or not they wanted to have the street closed. Again, we decided in Switzerland that we wanted to change the day when the rubbish was collected. Can you imagine in Britain writing to your council and saying to them, oh, we've decided we don't want the rubbish collected on Wednesday, we want it collected on Monday. Uh, <laughs> but they did this in Switzerland. And the council wrote back and said, well, the additional cost of doing this will be this. You can now decide, have a little vote, and decide whether you really want mm. to pay this extra money to have your rubbish collected on a different day. And people on the street decided whether they wanted to do that. There is no ability to do that in Britain. because You cannot change. Okay? And this isn't just little things, it's big things. Right? If you want to spend 5% more on defence, maybe you'll vote Conservative. If you want to spend 5% less, maybe you'll vote for the Labour Party. In Switzerland, they had a referendum on whether or not to abolish the army. Right. Now, they didn't abolish the army, but they had the choice, they had the ability to do that, right? Because they had the influence. And we don't have that influence in our country. You're talking because, to because, yeah, because power has been, take, right. the power has been taken away from us. Connected. Exactly, this gentleman is quite right, right? Yeah. Power has been taken away from us. And until we get power back in the hands of the people, people will not exercise their vote. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Peter, would you like to say Thank you very much for, talk, for the gentleman from Birmingham. We're sitting in an area that became the second city of the empire thanks to the raw political power used locally by the Chamberlain family. Just go and look at the council house, council house, the town hall, everything in that square, so destroyed by the 1960s planning. What we need to do is to strip 
things out, as everybody has said, from the quangocracy back to the people, but give people a voice, sometimes by referendum, but I have to say, bringing back democracy to local authorities, directly elected mayors on a second-tier authority doesn't work. They work beautifully in London, where you're looking at regional with light-touch powers. Secondly, the idea of the local authority cabinet system, which is truly the smoke-filled room, doesn't work. Go back to the old committee yeah, system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I now come back to the final, most controversial point for um, a Conservative, and it's something of what Spencer said. We can no longer have great areas of the country that disenfranchise, and the only way I think we will achieve it is to consider proportional representation yeah, 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 for local yeah. government. It is the only solution. Why should 50,000 people in Sheffield be permanently yeah, disenfranchised? Yeah, yeah. If they had a form of PR, oh, there would be a voice on Sheffield City. Look at the corruption yeah. of South Yorkshire because there are a handful of Conservative councillors. A PR system would have, they'd have 20, 30, 40, mm. 50 Tory councillors in every one of those authorities actually being able to do what I do. I'm lucky. I have an incredible, a small group, but I have an incredible group of councillors who give us backing. And the fact that the press can say to me, how do you do it with a group of five out of 45? When other parts of London, they're gobsmacked. I do it because I'm tenacious. I'm obsessed with right and wrong. There is either right and there is wrong. There is nothing in between. There's no grey area of right and wrong. You're good or bad. It's right or wrong. You break the law or you don't break the law. But I've got a group of councillors who are equally committed to right and wrong, and we stand there if anything is thrown at us. Mm -hmm. But if any way you'll do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think this has been a, a, a depressing, the gentleman is right, this has been a depressing um, discussion this evening, but similarly, it has been a, 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 an illuminating discussion because we all understand in this room that our democracy the ability for people, as Mark has said, in, in Switzerland, and there are some, some socio-issues with the Swiss and how they do things which might make it a little easier, but we have to get power back to the people. And until such time, as my, well, a couple of points really, very quickly. Firstly, we need to put people in Parliament who understand that there is this dislocation yes. and that they will fight hard on behalf of people, regardless of their political persuasion, to say, I am not one of the jabbering political class. I understand that we have got to get power back to the people. That is one thing we need to do. With regards to the problems we have with voter uh, 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 fraud, there are two thoughts, really, and I've argued this long and hard, and I've been talking to the wall mostly. I would like to stop this immediately by saying, unless you go into a polling station, you cannot vote. This is the one way of saying, in the short term, let's regain the situation that we had. I accept it will disenfranchise some people who cannot physically get out to vote, but we have to do something about this. And the second thing I would say is, in a, a, a democracy, if you have a judiciary that is not listening when criminality is happening, you have a dysfunctional yes. state. Yes. And many of us, in all sorts of different occasions, have said to the CPS, and it's not always the police, it's usually the CPS, there is an issue here, but for whatever reason, they do not challenge that. We must challenge this in the courts. It's right, whilst I have ducked and dived to some of the things that are coming from over here, it is right that we challenge this. But in a functioning democracy, you've got to have the ability to judicially challenge things that you know, as an individual person in this society, is not right. Well, thank you. I, I, you can't be depressed after that, or you can actually be absolutely happy that we've got some great people here who are actually fighting this and, and fighting the corner for democracy. And everyone, please thank the panel in the usual way. Thank you.